Here's William Lane Craig to give a few weak rebuttals to atheist arguments. God is just Santa Claus for adults. Well, I think that we have good arguments to show that God exists, and we have very powerful evidence that Santa Claus does not exist. There have been mappings of the North Pole and so forth. Uh, it's physically impossible for him to do what he's supposed to do on Christmas Eve. But we don't have comparably good arguments against God. So I think that the situation is not analogous. A Santa Claus believer can give rebuttals to those arguments that are perfectly analogous to the kind of arguments that theists give for God. They could say that Santa uses his magic to stay hidden, and he uses his magic to fly around the world in one night and squeeze down chimneys. Similarly, when you point out that mass and energy can neither be created nor destroyed, therefore can have no creator, or that people don't rise from the dead, a Christian apologist will say that God uses his powers to do those things. They won't say magic because that sounds silly, but it is essentially what they believe. Okay, next objection. Who created God, and how does your answer to that make any sense? My view is that God is a self-existent, uncreated, eternal being, and therefore cannot have a cause. And this is not something that's special pleading for God. The atheist has typically said this about the universe, that the universe is uncreated, eternal, and self-existent. Um, but I think that's highly unlikely in light of modern cosmology, mm. but it shows it's not special pleading for God. Well, if your point is that nothing is self-existent except God, then how is that not special pleading? If the universe is self-existent, then all of its most fundamental contents are as well. There's no special pleading in saying that the universe is self-existent, because then the fundamental components of everything are self-existent. It's not special pleading if it applies to the fundamental constituents of everything. Uh, what about when people say, they just say it? There's no evidence. Again, these what are statements say, and yeah, questions. Yeah, right. They're not really arguments. But yes, what I say to that is, is that what you think? Well, I can think of at least five good arguments for God's existence. They didn't say there are no arguments. They said there's no evidence. And given that it's not clear what a God is even supposed to be, it's not apparent what evidence for such a thing would even look like. And at that point, he's got to say, yeah, like what? And then I'm off and running, and I share with him a number of arguments for God's existence. So. It just completely pulls the rug from under the person who says there's no evidence for God's existence. How does giving arguments pull the rug out from someone who isn't asking for arguments? They're asking to be shown evidence. They want to be able to see God. They want to be able to see effects that can only be explained by God, or at least can be most probably explained by God. Science explains so much of what we used to attribute to God. Well, I would agree that we shouldn't postulate some sort of God of the gaps where we use God to plug up the holes in our scientific knowledge. But I think that we have uh, very powerful scientific evidence for premises in philosophical arguments for the existence of God. For example, the second premise of the Kalam cosmological argument— Why don't you lay the whole thing out for those who aren't right. aware? That argument has three steps. Uh, one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. I don't believe that this premise is true. Perhaps it's the case that everything whose existence was preceded by a time at which it didn't exist has a cause, but I see no reason to believe that something which has existed at all points in time would need a cause. I don't think time itself needs a cause, for example. There was obviously never a time when time didn't exist. In this sense, time has always existed, in that it has existed for at least all of the 13.7 billion years that we know time to have existed. If something has always existed, why would its existence need a cause? Two. The universe began to exist. The universe began to exist in the sense that it doesn't look like it has a past which stretches back to infinity, but it didn't begin to exist in the sense that there was a time that it didn't exist followed by a time that it does. It didn't enter existence. As best we can tell, it has existed for as long as time has existed, and in that sense has always existed. And again, I don't see why something which has always existed needs a cause. Three, therefore the universe has a cause. Now, the second premise, the universe began to exist, is one to which scientific evidence is relevant. And contemporary cosmology provides, honestly, very, very powerful evidence in support of the truth of that second premise. The evidence for that premise is pretty good, but it isn't as conclusive as Craig thinks it is. So, in this case, you've got a philosophical argument for God's existence 
that contains a premise which is powerfully supported by contemporary science. Mm -hmm. Another example would be the design argument based on the fine-tuning of the universe. And it also has three steps. One, the fine-tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, mm -hmm. chance, or design. Two, it is not due to physical necessity or chance. Three, therefore, it is due to design. And again, the second premise that the fine-tuning is not due to physical necessity or chance is powerfully supported by contemporary science. How so? What evidence do we have that the parameters and constants of the universe have ever been free to vary? We can imagine the universe having different constants, but that doesn't mean that it actually could have ever had them. The fact that we can imagine such a huge range of other possible constants, which would make the ones we have improbable if they were free to vary randomly, I think is evidence that they were not free to vary randomly, if at all. Richard Dawkins argues against physical necessity hmm. on scientific grounds. Well, if biologist Richard Dawkins says something about cosmology, it must be correct. So he has two uh, options left. Yes, and then Roger Penrose, a more formidable <laughs> intellect than Dawkins, of Oxford University argues against chance purely on the basis of scientific evidence. Hmm. So there's very good scientific evidence for that second premise and given that premise, then you have a philosophical argument for a cosmic designer. The idea that a god fine-tuned the universe has some interesting theological implications. To say that our existence would be impossible if the parameters of the universe were even slightly different is to say, essentially, that the supposedly all-powerful god who fine-tuned those parameters did not, in fact, have the power to put us into a universe with parameters different from the ones held by the universe in which we inhabit. The fine-tuning argument would be far more compelling if apologists said that god is pretty powerful, but he isn't all-powerful. Maybe he can tweak the constants of the universe, but he has no control over the laws of physics. However, if he can both, then there seems to be no reason why he would ever need to fine-tune a universe in order for us to inhabit it. In fact, since what we are, fundamentally, is souls, and souls are not physical, whatever that means, it's unclear why he would need any universe at all to put us into, let alone a finely tuned one. When this is pointed out to some apologists, they move the goalpost from the universe being fine-tuned for our existence to it being fine-tuned for God's preferences, which is a claim that is totally unfalsifiable. I will often ask the atheist or agnostic, why do you refuse to follow the evidence where it leads? Hmm. Why are you so resistant to the beginning of the universe? I don't know too many atheists or agnostics who are resistant to the beginning of the universe. When that's where the evidence points, that's a religiously neutral statement that can be found in any textbook on astronomy or astrophysics, and yet some people will just dig in their heels at that because I think they see where it, it, it's leading. Well, it's not leading to the incoherent idea of a timeless, spaceless, disembodied mind as you've described God as being. And so it's not a matter of appealing to gaps in our knowledge. It's saying, please, why won't you follow the evidence where it points? Which are you more convinced of, the argument from philosophy or astrophysics when it comes to the finitude of the world? Wow. Uh, I suppose I like the philosophical arguments. I am a philosopher. Those really persuade me, um, whereas science is, of course, always provisional and capable of revision. Unlike philosophy, which, as everybody knows, is never open to revision. And so what one has to say is that the scientific evidence that we have now provides very powerful support of the second premise. But these metaphysical arguments against the infinitude of the past just strike me as cogent, persuasive, and they've been around for yes. a thousand years or more. Which philosophical arguments for the finitude of the universe does Craig find persuasive? Is it the infinite regress argument? I think Bertrand Russell made the best argument against that one when he said that there's no logical problem with an infinite regress because there's no logical problem with a series that has no first term. And this is something I really hope Thomas Aquinas is wrong about. Because yes. he has blistering words to say about the Kalam argument. His contemporary, St. Bonaventure, exactly. pr proposed it, and, um, but uh, I hope he's wrong. And yes. whenever I hear people articulate it, I mean, it seems, seems cogent well, in, to me. in defense of Aquinas. Way to go. This is a way to appeal okay. to our fan base. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> yes. In defense of Aquinas, 
He does think that the Kalam cosmological argument offered by these Islamic theologians is a good probability argument. Hmm. It does establish that there probably is a first cause of the origin of the universe. But because Aquinas' standard for success in natural theology is so high that it has to be a demonstration, Ah. he says we shouldn't use these probability arguments. They make us look bad. They They are an embarrassment. He says before unbelievers, we, we would should restrict ourselves to strict demonstrations. Well, almost no natural theologian today holds hmm. to so high and unrealistic a standard. Aquinas had some silly arguments, many of which leaned heavily on outdated Aristotelian ideas, but he took great care to structure his arguments very rigorously. As Craig points out, natural theologians today, and also I would say apologists, have abandoned that rigor. To everyone who helps me out on Patreon, you're a big help. Thanks so much.